Okay, so my name is Kingsley Greenland. I'm CEO of the Debt Exchange. Uh, Con asked me to come and tell you a little bit about what was going on. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Do a little bit of, uh, after the previous presentations, like a poker player sitting at the table wondering uh, who the fool is, but anyway, I hope it's not me. Uh, what I want to do is talk about, uh, we just talk, talked about financial engineering, Ron, that was great. Uh, what my world is, is the actual assets that are underneath uh, the financial engineering, whether it be securitization, whether it be CIV, CDOs, whatever the case may be. I'm talking about hard assets. Uh, generally speaking, they are financial assets that are secured by something that is tangible. Um, uh, Con asked me to come in and say, so what's going on in our company? I'm just going to kind of talk about it briefly, then talk to you about where our, where our company plays, which is the secondary market for commercial debt. You can cross off commercial and put in residential now, uh, and I'll explain why that is occurring. But uh, let me back up and tell you about uh, DEDEX. We refer to it as DEDEX. <coughs> DEDEX is an electronic marketplace uh, where assets are bought and sold. So think of it like the stock exchange, except for its for underlying financial assets. Uh, we happen to be in an interesting position in that, although we didn't build the company for what's happening right now, it is extremely valuable for banks right now to be able to move assets that are underperforming off their balance sheet. So the long and short of it is, how is DEDEX doing in the recession? DEDEX is doing very well in the recession, but it's for an unfortunate reason. So now let me back up to you, back you up 10 years and tell you why we built this marketplace. It'll give you, give, give you some interesting insight. We built this marketplace so that illiquid assets could be moved between holders of the illiquid assets. So think of a bank, Think of, a, think of a loan on an office building like this. So this is a contrary to a securitization play. This is the whole asset. So that banks could engage in active portfolio management the same way you would engage in active portfolio management on your 401k. Once a year, presumably, if you're following the advisors, you'll go look at your 401k and reweight your assets between stocks and bonds. And we built this marketplace so banks would be able to reweight their assets among illiquid assets, real estate loans and other types of loans, so that they wouldn't have asset concentrations. Uh, the idea was that looking back at the 90s and what happened in New England, part of the problem was banks were concentrated in real estate loans, and when the market uh, got into trouble and there was a recession here, liquidity dried up. So even though you may have had a good real estate asset, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't finance it. So this is, a, this is another tool like securitization, but the idea was if you could get banks across the country to be able to transfer assets so that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be stuck in their footprint, so to speak, that liquidity would move freely from region to region, depending on the port, irregardless of, regardless of the economic conditions in the, in the local area. So that was the idea of what we did that, what we built this marketplace for. Two years ago, 50% of our volume was performing loans. 50% was non-performing, or stressed. I'll generically use the term non-performing, but it means an asset that has some sort of credit issue around it. Uh, in this case, the credit issue, maybe the asset is performing, but it's over levered. Right now, the volume is roughly 90% credit stressed, 10% performing. And I would suspect that that 10% performing is going to, going to uh, go down to zero in the very near future. So we have this marketplace that trades illiquid assets. Let me define illiquid assets for you before I get into the presentation. I'm going fast again, just give you the framework. When we started this, we defined illiquid assets as a financial instrument that you could not get three bids within a couple of basis points within a few hours from your broker dealer. So that's how we look at the illiquid world. So we built this marketplace where you could take that asset out to thousands of counterparties and they could construct bids in a very quick period of time and therefore you could create liquidity for the assets. Within this marketplace, we built tools that made it very easy for people, pools of capital, what we're talking about, the institutions, to construct their bid very quickly and reliably to reduce the friction and the deal cost. So in essence, what we, turned, what we took was what well, was an illiquid asset because you didn't have price uh, transparency because you couldn't get it, and put it and created a marketplace where you could generate a significant number of bids in a short period of time, thereby creating transparency and liquidity for the asset. Great idea. Nobody really, really uh, wanted to do it in the uh, <laughs> in the early decade because banks were compensated, banks and bankers, much like Ron said, for asset aggregation. So, me as a banker, I might sit there and say gosh, I'm overweighted uh, in commercial real estate assets or, or in the real life case that we're seeing right now, acquisition and development loans, which we're uh, relying on the residential market to, to, to succeed. On the other hand, that's what I get paid for. I get compensated to have a big book of those so I wouldn't sell them. So they, they, they tended to, the market didn't tend to work the way that we thought it would go when we built it. So where are we today? 
The good news is, is that when everybody talks about what's going on in the banking market and this problem, there are places and there is a very active secondary market where these assets can be sold and priced very efficiently. So the contrary opinion that I'm going to take here for everybody, contrary to what you're reading and what you may be hearing in Washington, D.C., is that there, is, there are prices for these assets, the underlying assets. There may not be for the securities. The reason there aren't for securities is because the underlying assets haven't been priced. But we can price all these assets, and I'm not just talking about debt I'm talking about the larger market as a whole. The problem is, is that the banks don't have the capital to actually mark the assets to what their value is. So when you look at, going back to TARP and what you, what you brought up earlier, Martin, the issue isn't necessarily is the capital there to buy it. The issue is, can the banks afford to sell it at the price that's out there? So now let me give you a couple of interesting things and then I'll explain the market. Okay, so, so pricing. I'm gonna give you an interesting uh, tidbit or what I think is interesting. Right now we price about $850 billion of commercial real estate loans a month. We make that available in Bloomberg. That is the underlying collateral for, call it 80% of the CMBS universe. So if you look at the price of that 80% of the underlying CMBS universe, the average price now over the last six months has dropped to below 80, so I believe it's 83%. That means that all those real estate loans that you look at that were originated with all the structure that was put in place are not worth par even though they're performing. If you wanted to sell them, you would have to take a 17% loss if you wanted to liquidate the whole collateral pool. That is similar to what's happening in the residential market. And I say you can add residential because residential is now an illiquid asset, so we sell quite a bit of it. So if you look at the, at the ABS market, the average residential loan performing is selling in the 60s. So I mean, you, you guys can do the math. That's a 40% knock, and that's, that's the performing loans. So when you look at the subprime and you look at the ABS, the value of the structure that it's in is something far less than 60%. And that's the problem with the conundrum for the banks. It's, uh, our, our opinion, our belief is, these assets are liquid. It's the price, and it's the methodology. One way to resolve that would be to unwind the structures and sell the underlying assets themselves. It's a whole other issue that you know Ron and others can talk about, about the legality of it, what happens to the investor. But to move the assets off the bank's balance sheets, that's just one of many ways. I'm going to give you just another piece of, uh, give you an idea of the marketplace. Uh, Mark talked about the FDIC and the closures. Uh, yesterday, we liquidated the remains of a receivership for the FDIC. We are one of their vendors on a long-term contract, and we do it regularly. These markets are liquid. I'm telling you, we take them to market, we get many, many bids, and they clear quickly. We're taking four receiverships to market March 17th, and we have a pipeline that goes for the foreseeable future. So these assets, if you have the ability to price them, don't get stuck. They can move. There are buyers out there. What am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. I'm going to flip through this. You had it. I just want to bring out a couple of things that you may or may not find interesting, and we'll kind of move to the question and answer. Secondary market for commercial debt. You can call it residential. Quick overview. Where did it come from? Um, just uh, This is uh, CMBS delinquency rates to give you an idea of what's happening right now. The piece that I want, to, want you to focus on is right down here, this kick up. That's the toxicity that you're talking about in the bank's balance sheets. It's going to keep on going up. It's a function of uh, subprime and all pay loans, but it's also a function of general deleveraging in the marketplace. So even your prime loans, many of them are not worth par, even though you have a high FICO score borrower, because the LTV is too high, long and short of it. Uh, this is to just give you an idea of the uh, delinquency rates by property type. Although they're all kicking up, uh, what's most interesting is on the, on the top line here, multifamily. <coughs> we talked about residential, where we expect to see the most rapid increase in the near future is in this line right here, that's retail. That's a function, again, of what's happening in the economy. The way we look at what happened in the economy, two different things. You have the credit markets blow up, and you have a recession. So although the two are related, we look at it really as a one-two punch. So what you're seeing now is a function of the credit markets, which drives the, the residential real estate pricing, liquidity, things like that, causing a slowdown, which is going to transfer across other asset classes. Not good news. This is the uh, subprime as a percent of all loan originations, to, just to give you an idea. This was the, uh, the, the grand plan, or I don't, I don't want to say the grand plan, but during this period, people were talking about how owner, home ownership was going up and what a good thing it was for home ownership to go up. Well, we were financing it with loans that couldn't be paid back for the, the increased home ownership. 
Uh, this is the Case Schiller Home Index. What you want to look at right here is just the drop in price. That's when the credit market's unwound on the residential side. What happened was you couldn't finance with cheap money. You couldn't overfinance, so to speak. So the assets return to, in our opinion, a more normalized value. There are two ways to look at it. One, you can say that the assets are fairly depressed and they will return to their normalized value. The other way to look at it is the value itself was overpriced because of cheap liquidity. And in fact, what they're doing is they're returning to a more normalized value now. Another way to look at it for you individually is you can look at your 401k and say, oh my gosh, it's down 50%. When will it come back? Or you could say it's at its real value now because there's a liquid market pricing those every day. And in fact, it was overpriced before. Who are the sellers and why? I'm going to flow right through this because uh, let's just say they're banks, insurance companies, anybody who owns assets, they sell for a no uh, number of reasons. Right now, many of them are selling because they have to. I will tell you that in the bank market, for us, the number of institutions that want to sell assets has increased considerably. Our volume was up over 200% last year. First quarter of this year, many of the banks are not able to sell because of the cost that they would take to their capital position to sell. So when you look at TARP, putting the, putting the capital in the banks is not enough. It's long and short of it. What am I doing, Kevin? Okay. Buyers, it's highly fragmented. It's very, very deep. Uh, it was investment banks, it was other capital source who were aggregating the assets again, putting them in CDOs, securitizing them, putting in SIBs, whatever. It was an asset aggregation game. Pricing was a little bit out of whack. The price on the secondary market has come down considerably. Again, for the same cause as securitization and residential real estate has come down. Um, they were actually banks, wholesale banks, commercial banks for the performing loans. Opportunity funds, large opportunity funds. Right. World's changed. All of these institutions that you look at were relying on financing through the capital markets. Capital markets financing, with the exception of banks that were doing it on the deposit base. <coughs> now it's become very, very local. When we sell commercial real estate, more than half the time now we're selling to local capital. That may be, that may be developers, it may be lawyers who have gotten together and think that it's a good opportunity, but it's local pools of capital. The amount of capital in our marketplace is stunning. Two guys named Ted, that's just to give you an idea that it's, it, it really is local. The major players have, uh, the major players have left the market. At DEDEX, we have over 8,000 registered pools of capital that are on our marketplace, to give you an idea of that. That's doubled in a year. And these are pools of capital that have come together to say, we believe these assets are now appropriately or underly priced, underpriced, and we want to invest. But uh, just to get just a bit about DEDEX to let you know, this, this isn't a guy in a basement who's coming in and saying, hey, I want to buy an asset. It's not like eBay. All a bunch of the functionality is similar to an eBay or in a, in a combination of Christie's. But these folks go through an accreditation process with us and vetting and prove they have capital and things like that. So these are real pools of capital. Many of them are LLCs. Uh, many of them are, are Delaware Corps. Some of them are just very, very wealthy individuals. <coughs> Am I going too fast? Does anybody have any questions? Good. How do they buy the assets? Still discounted cash flow. Uh, asset valuation, that's current comp, that's not historical comp. Bit of a disconnect when you look at uh, how the, the residential uh, ABS is being priced as opposed to actual value of the underlying assets, still. Uh, geographically, the, the capital is uh, generally located in certain areas now. And uh, just a couple other ways. Price per pound, that's for a non-performing asset. You look at it, you say, okay, I think it's worth uh, X number of dollars to turn it into the residential world. Gosh, the, the building was financed at 300 bucks a square foot. Replacement cost is 180 bucks a square foot. I think I'm good at 100 bucks a square foot. It's kind of the analysis people go through. Site inspections, exit analysis, exit analysis. That's how am I gonna get out of there in what time? That's how, you, that's how people are pricing these assets. How much time do I have? One more minute. One minute. Okay, just give you an idea of the, sp of the spreads, the yields that our people are looking for. Uh, it goes from 10%, which is rare now, up to 35%. Most of that is on an unlevered basis. I can't just flip through pages, so I think I will go. Let you all take a look at it. I want to go to the last one and just give you an idea of where prices are. Uh, that's what we've seen in the decreasing prices. This is for the underlying asset. So if you're looking at multifamily, down 20%. Uh, retail, about 
If you look at that to your stock market values, the hard asset for real estate has decreased less in value than the, uh, the equity. I'll call it up. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.